Uh, this is the last last uh, lecture of, of Mises U, I guess. So uh, yeah, that's better. Um, this is my favorite lecture to give. I'm supposed to laugh about that. That's third time I've said that. So. Um, changing preferences and all of that stuff. So, um, but this this really is this really is a fun lecture, I think, for me at least, because it's um, it's kind of poking fun at my own profession, um, and uh, I I, I want to say str straight off from the start, I, I think in past years when I've talked about this, I I've conveyed inadvertently the impression that nobody should go to college, and that's not really what I'm going to argue here. Um, I do have a few criticisms, maybe a lot of criticisms, of the way higher education is done, and I hope to go through a few of those with you here. Um, I'm going to mention a few sources, but I do, as with my other talks, I've got a QR code at the end, and that'll take you to a PDF of this uh, presentation, as well as some sources that, um, that I think you might find helpful um, if you wanted to look into this further. But as you can see from the graph up here, um, higher education is one of those areas of the economy that we've seen rapidly rising prices faster than average, certainly, and people have felt this in higher tuition burdens. We've seen people struggling with student loans, and the, the student loan uh, aggregate amount seems to be rising and rising. Uh, tuition um, has in increased at most in institutions faster than inflation rates for quite some time, and some colleges are now extremely expensive. It's rare to find a college that has gotten cheaper in real terms. But you'll notice that all of these that are highlighted in yellow are areas where the government has had a larger than normal um, intervention into the provision of that good or service. And you see hospital services, um, medical care services, child care, nursery school, housing, uh, all of these have had rapid increases in cost and uh, college tuition is right up there along with college textbooks, of course, you know how much textbooks can cost. So uh, I think there are several reasons for this that I'd like to go through with you here. Um, the first one is what I'll call subsidy-fueled overinvestment. So we need to think a little bit about what it is that college does. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And um, you might say, well, we're, we're trying to educate people. We're trying to get people to think critically. We're trying to provide them with information that they need to go out into the workplace or whatever their, their occupation might be. And we're transferring skills. We're trying to, to um, make people more productive in the workplace with educating them on how to think and, and how to reason. Um, an alternative would be that maybe this is just about signaling. Maybe it's just conveying the information to a potential employer that you're hardworking, motivated, intelligent, and you can see a task through for four years and, or more years, and you can uh, uh, demonstrate that you've got the capacity to engage in higher order thinking. We'll talk about that for a little bit. And then also there's the possibility that this is just a consumption good. I mean, colleges are fun. They, they have uh, opportunities for students to do things that, that are entertaining. Um, most colleges that I know of have made some attempt to have a kind of a park-like environment with lots of facilities for students to spend time uh, when they're not studying, which is a lot of the time. And uh, so, I mean, you look around at, at, at Auburn's campus, you see an example of that. It's just beautiful buildings, uh, nice landscaping, uh, lots of buildings that are kind of dedicated to student um, entertainment and uh, making sure that you're comfortable. Uh, dormitories have gotten more and more uh, luxurious as time has gone on. So maybe that's a part of it as well. What is fairly clear if you look at college and graduate school graduates is that earnings do tend to be higher for people with more education. Um, unemployment rates tend to be lower as you have more education. And so this is kind of the, the story that we get for uh, promoting college education. And the, the reason you see many, many people arguing that, that uh, you, know, you should go to college and you should 
borrow whatever amount you need to to, to make that happen. Um, annual earnings tend to be higher. Um, it, of course, earnings are going to change over your lifespan. You're going to see higher earnings as you, as you get older and gain more experience. But uh, regardless of the age group, it seems that there are higher earnings. Now, it does matter what your major is. I don't want to pick on anybody's major in particular, but if you, you, you can think of probably several where you know that if you major in certain things, your income is not going to be as high as if you majored in, I don't know, petroleum engineering or something. So, um, you're going to see a lot higher earnings in some majors than, than in others. Now, that's not to say that earnings should be or, or, or that it is even for most students the primary um, objective. Um, you can do a lot of, of great things with a humanities degree, even if humanities degrees don't top out the income scales. But a lot of what's going on appears to be something like an arms race, um, where you've got competition going on across students to demonstrate to employers that they are more skilled, more motivated, more intelligent, more capable, more persevering than the other applicants for a job. So what if a college education is at least partly an investment in a relative standing? It, it, it's then more about how much you have relative to others, not so much about the absolute amount of understanding or reasoning capacity you have. So employers may use this educational attainment as a signal of motivation, perseverance, and intelligence. So let's just suppose as a thought experiment that the top 50% of college graduates, the most educated, um, have good job opportunities, and those that fall, fall into the bottom half uh, get bad jobs. Well, then you're going to be constantly in this uh, race to be in that top half, and the more education other people get, the more you need to get to make sure you stay in that top half. So if this is just about ranking rather than gathering an absolute amount of reasoning capacity or, or information that will help you in your, in your career, then um, when we introduce government subsidies into higher education, that's simply going to fuel overinvestment in this kind of attempt to, to demonstrate that you're a superior employment candidate. Uh, you would just be gathering more of that signal of motivation, perseverance, and intelligence, uh, sort of like the, the Cold War um, uh, race between the Soviet Union and the United States to see who could gather up more missiles. And of course, if you're in the military industrial complex, you're going you're gonna to overcount the other side so that you get the chance to build more uh, missiles and have more lucrative contracts. But you know, that's, that's college administrations uh, saying, look, you need to have a college degree. You need to give us more money so that you're better prepared for the workplace. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, competition among graduates, but probably more of that investment than you would see if you did not have those government subsidies. So people are maybe foregoing preparatory strategies that would have prepared them well for their careers other than this formal degree granting process, so we get a kind of a credential inflation. Uh, instead of something that's easily um, documented, like a college degree, um, you could be doing something else that maybe doesn't show up so well um, in, a, in a formal sheepskin that you get when you graduate, but you, you would have um, maybe a, a better opportunity to gather those skills. So formal education may still pay off for many people, and many of you, probably most of you, are engaged in formal education, but some people will be over-investing. They'll be investing more then it is really going to benefit um, if you count all of the cost, time and money, long-term student debt. Now, some majors will end up paying the same tuition, but end up with a lower return. Um, and, and we know that some of those are, are you know, characteristically, they're going to be humanities majors or something like that, where it's very interesting stuff and valuable. And I think that you can do a lot with those uh, majors if you apply yourselves. But it's, um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to find a higher paying job in those, in those fields. Um, nothing against, um, against those. But there is also an, inter uh, an interesting phenomenon that if you, if you drop out the week before you're scheduled to graduate, you don't get your degree, your, your diploma, 
before graduating. Your earnings capacity will be far lower than someone who stayed the extra week or the extra semester and finished the course and, and, and got your degree. That's something known as the sheepskin effect. Um, if, you, if you finish the, the entire four, if you did three years and dropped out, you would not be able to expect three-fourths of the job opportunities and earnings capacity as, as someone who had done all four years. So that's an indicator that there's something else going on besides acquisition of knowledge and skills and reasoning capacity, because otherwise you would expect, well, three years out of four, you'd, you'd have three-fourths of what they intended for you to learn. But um, that's apparently not um, really um, uh, the key. It's important to remember that there are some non-monetary payoffs to education. Um, I know someone who went on to get a chemical engineering PhD and did not work in that field, but instead um, uh, homeschooled her kids, did a fantastic job with it as far as I know, uh, did you know, wonderful things um, with, uh, within her family and and you know the, the chemical engineering PhD was not really put to use as such, but um, that's uh, nevertheless going through the process of higher education probably did in some way make her a better teacher of her own children. Richard Vetter wrote a book um, uh, came out a couple of years ago called "Restoring the Promise," and it's a criticism of higher education and the way we conduct it today in the United States. This is a chart from that book that shows the education requirements of occupations held by college graduates. And so you can see here that about 52% of the um, occupations held by college graduates actually require a bachelor's degree. Um, a little over a third require a high school diploma or less. And yet, the people in those jobs have four-year degrees. Um, and some require maybe only a two-year degree, but you're doing this with a four-year degree. So you've es essentially over-invested, which is part of Vetter's um, point. Uh, another way to look at this is uh, this, the, these are the jobs requiring a college degree versus the number of college graduates. So we are producing a large number of college graduates without the demand in the workforce uh, for college graduates. People are, again, somewhat over-investing in, in college education. If, and this is a comparison here that Vetter has between 1970 and 2010. So taxi drivers and chauffeurs in 1970 were very unlikely to have a uh, college degree, um, a bachelor's degree or, or more. But by 2010, that had risen, risen to 15%. Do you really need a four-year degree to drive a taxi? Uh, shipping and receiving clerks, similar increases. Uh, salesmen and sales clerks in the retail trade, uh, now almost a fourth of those have a four-year degree. Um, in 1970, it would have been 5%. Uh, these, are, these are really remarkable to see people who are in these jobs that, that have these. Now, Maybe these are stepping stones to something else, and maybe uh, you know, five, 10 years from, from now, they won't be working as a, a retail clerk anymore. They will be uh, moving on to something that does require a four-year degree. So we, this is not really looking at the time uh, uh, trajectory of a person's career, but it does, I think, indicate something, especially if you're comparing this to um, some years ago. Now, those of you that have seen this talk before may recognize this diagram. I've modified it a little bit um, this year, but I would, I would ask you to think of higher education as, as, at least in part, a kind of filter where you've got people in the general population who would like to demonstrate that they have certain characteristics to a potential employer. They'd like to demonstrate that they are motivated, persevering, and intelligent. How do you do that? You can go to the employer and say, hey, I'm motivated, persevering, and intelligent, but the employer may not believe that without some evidence that you are, in fact, in possession of those characteristics. So um, how, do you, how do you prove this? Well, you go through some kind of filter. You, you pay, um, and you take some time, and you go through this process. 
and you demonstrate that you're motivated, persevering, and intelligent because only people who are motivated, persevering, and intelligent make it through that, that filter. Anyone else can't make it through the filter um, if, if the filter is a good filter and doesn't have holes in it, which it now does. But um, So if you pass that, then you have certified yourself or you have had the college or university certify you as having those desirable characteristics. In this sense, um, the more difficult the major is that you choose, the better a signal you're generating, which may explain why some Wall Street firms that are in the, obviously, the financial industry like to hire people who are physics majors, not because you need to understand physics to be um, good at finance, but if you are, everybody knows physics is difficult, and if you have demonstrated your ability to get through a four-year program that is difficult, you can't really do that unless you're motivated, persevering, and intelligent. So that's a, that's a method of sorting out, uh, for employers, sorting out those who have those characteristics versus those who do not. Now, uh, this is the filter as it might have existed in, say, 1950 or 1960 or 1970. Um, you have a lot of people that bypass the filter and just say, well, I'm not going to spend the money and I'm not going to take the time to do this. I'm going to go into the workforce, demonstrate my abilities in some other way, and uh, I'm not going to be certified, but maybe I'm still motivated, persevering, and intelligent, and I'll communicate that to employers in, in some other way. You know, I, I think of my, my grandfather who uh, made it through eighth grade, and that was it. Um, he, he quit school after that and did not go any further. He did quite well um, in life, but he was an extremely hard worker and had to demonstrate his, his abilities by simply um, uh, doing the job well and proving himself in that way. That was a lot more common in his, in his time than it would be today, but uh, nevertheless, that's, that he, he just avoided the filter completely. Now, if you take taxpayer dollars from the general population, and you pour those dollars into higher education and subsidize people going through this filter, you're going to encourage people to put themselves through this process who otherwise would have chosen some other means of demonstrating their abilities. And so we now have institutions, colleges and universities, that look at every person in the population as a person who's carrying around a little backpack of government money. And the only way to get that government money is to admit that person into the institution, uh, pluck that money off of that person's back for the next four years, keep them in the school, we want to have retention, and then graduate this individual after having collected uh, whatever grants, loans, et cetera, that, that we can glean from this individual. So that tends to make the filter a little less effective because then the college or university is, um, is very tempted to uh, gather more of those subsidies by bringing in more students. And you get a lot more people who are certified as being motivated, persevering, and intelligent, but the filter may not be the same as it once was. Um, colleges expand and, um, and, and produce a lot more graduates, some of whom are in possession of those characteristics, others are not. Uh, some people still bypass the filter, uh, so they fall into that lower population there of people who are not certified but are motivated, persevering, and intelligent, and others who uh, don't have those characteristics at all. So um, Brian Kaplan, who's wrote a book called The Case Against Education, has said that since the status quo is supported by hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies, we're probably underusing alternative certification methods like apprenticeships, testing, boot camps, Mises University. He didn't say that. But, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing here. This is an, this is, uh, an alternative. I mean, there, there are certain employers out there who probably love to see that you, you went through Mises U. I mean, that's, that's a great thing. Uh, he says, signaling explains why students are far more concerned about grades than actual learning. They want easy A's, not professors who teach lots of job skills. Signaling explains why cheating pays. A successful cheater profits by impersonating a good student. And signaling explains why students readily forget course material the day after the final exam. Once you've got the good signal in your transcript, you can usually safely forget whatever you learned. 
Now this uh, brings me to, uh, a, a, I would say, a growing problem in higher ed, which is plagiarism. Uh, you have administrators who are incentivized to keep enrollments up, especially given the declining population of 18 to 22 year olds, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but administrators don't have a lot of incentive to vigorously prosecute plagiarism because that, even though there are some pluses to maintaining academic integrity, those are offset to some extent by these, again, strong temptation that higher education institutions have to keep warm bodies in those desks and uh, collect those, those tuition dollars. So that means that they want to maintain the reputation of being having, having integrity, but when it comes down to it, do you really want to see that student exit the campus and take all of the remaining dollars with them? Um, and I would say that there's some technological challenges that we're struggling with now as well. Uh, we get a lot more online classes. Even residential schools will have a lot of their students taking online classes. They're, they're in a dorm and they're on their computer taking a class online. Uh, cheating in that framework, in that environment, is lower cost uh, because of the nature of the interaction between students and faculty. And AI, as you probably know, is making that problem even worse. Um, faculty on their side have not a lot of incentives to try to follow all of the bureaucratic procedures to try to prosecute a case of academic dishonesty. If they do, it's because they really do feel kind of internally compelled to maintain academic integrity. But it's almost like the, in, in, in some cases, the, the, the deck is kind of stacked against them. They really um, are you want to spend hours dealing with this case and the appeal and the unpleasantness and the back and forth with the, it, it's just, it's not pleasant. So there's a temptation on the part of a lot of faculty to just turn a blind eye to it and let it, let it slide. Um, I'm one of those people that's just kind of motivated <laughs> internally to just try to uh, root it out because it, it's personally kind of offensive to my sense of justice, but it's nevertheless, even, even, in, even there, I'm, I'm probably uh, pursuing lower level sentences, if you want to think of it that way, than, than I could because I know that I'm not going to get as much blowback from administration or faculty if, or, or students if, um, if I, if I you know, sort of like the you know, sheriff's deputy that pulls you over for going 80 and a 55 and writes you a ticket for going 65 and a 55. Um, sort of buying off your, your, uh, your, your, some of that unpleasantness that might result from, from taking it all the way to the, to the limit that would be possible. Uh, the AI challenge is, is serious, uh, for, especially for schools that have a large online component. Wofford College, where I, where I teach, does not have a, uh, an online program at all. We don't, we don't have anything like that. Uh, it's increasingly unusual um, to see that. So I asked uh, ChatGPT, does ChatGPT make cheating on college essays easier? And so this is the response I got from ChatGPT, uh, which sort of fessed up and said, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> it can generate content, paraphrase, uh, provide some uh, research assistance that could be easily misused. And it's, it's frankly difficult to, um, to prove that this is what's going on with an essay, although um, I'm 90% sure when it happens that that's what's going on, it's, it's difficult to, to make a, a case that will easily stick, and that just adds to this problem of trying to maintain academic integrity. Great inflation. So um, we have seen some things change in the way faculties are structured. We see a lot of part-time instructors, adjunct instructors, and the motivations for these faculty tends to be different. Um, this has probably increased grade inflation because if you've got an instructor who's on a short-term renewable contract, that person doesn't have the kind of job security where they can downplay the, the, the priority that they're putting on, on uh, student feedback and student evaluations. 
Uh, student va evaluations are quite important to someone who might be um, moving on to back onto the job market in a year. And they really have to think, well, you know, I don't want to be applying for a new teaching position and my students just, um, just ripped into me because I gave out a lot of C's and D's in my class. So I want to make sure my students are really happy. And the way to do that is to make sure that I, I kind of buy those good uh, teaching evaluations with good grades. Um, one study from 2022 that I've got in my source list online uh, says that the increase in graduation rates over the last 30 years has been due to grade inflation. Um, we, we're not handing out as many D's and F's. We're passing students who previously would have probably failed. Um, so this is a good example of that. Uh, the red line on this chart is the um, percentage of A's granted to uh, students, and this is starting in 1940 up through about 2012 or so. You can see in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s, um, there was a, a pretty strong increase. And um, this too is a function of government intervention in higher education, I would say, because there are thresholds. You have to maintain this particular GPA to continue to qualify for those government dollars. And because tuition is high, you, your continuing in school is dependent on those grades and, and not just a grade of, of um, you know, uh, a, a D or a C, but you, you have to maintain for some scholarships um, a grade that's maybe an A or B average. And again, the, the high cost of college education means that students now are under much more pressure and they will then in turn go to their professor and say, well, look, if I don't get a you know, a C in your class or a B in your class, then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to drop out because I'll lose my scholarship. Well, I mean, I'm not exactly heartless, and I don't want to see students drop out. At least I don't want to feel like I'm the cause of that. So there's a, there's, I mean, there are times when I hold the line, but then there are times where I, uh, maybe this is really close on the edge and maybe I should lean in favor of the student uh, grade being a little bit higher, and um, uh, I probably shouldn't be doing that, but that's, um, that's certainly a lot, of, a lot of pressure to put on, on, um, on someone who's, who's got that ability to, to move the grade a little bit one way or, the, or another. Uh, can I have a little bit of extra credit? You know, that, that kind of question. Um, Students, meanwhile, I mean, if you see these higher A's and B's, and I've had, I've had students ask me, well, isn't this, couldn't this just be because students are working harder and they're smarter and they've got the internet now, and so they, they got more access to information at their, at their fingertips than they did maybe in the 1970s, and so that's why those A's are going up. Well, first of all, you'll notice that that percentage really went up between about 1964 and about 1974. Um, no internet. Um, that's, that's not really what's, what's going on. Um, students do seem to be spending less time on their work. And, uh, again, I've, I've had, after this talk, I've had students come up to me and say, well, maybe this is because it doesn't take as long to do the work because you have the internet. Whereas you were working with card catalogs and flipping through index cards when you went to the library, and it just takes us not much time to do these kinds of things. Well, there are very few substitutes for actually putting your eyeballs on a page, even if it's a computer screen, and actually reading. And students are reading a lot less than they once were. And, and fac what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> faculty are probably not being as demanding about the reading either. So uh, now, what about this question of whether college might be just a consumption good? It's, it's, you go to college not so much because of the educational characteristics and, and, and maybe not just because of the signaling, but maybe because it's just a lot of fun. You get to be in a, um, a space with other people your age who share some characteristics with you. Uh, it's kind of a dating pool you can get into. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are attractive for college if you're looking at it, at it as a consumption good. Uh, Jonathan Newman says, uh, as, at some of the most prestigious flagship universities, test results indicate the average graduate shows little or no improvement in critical thinking over four years. 
And um, th this is based on some research that came out a few years ago that showed that, in fact, we're just not seeing the kind of improvement in critical thinking. What is it the students are doing? That's what they're doing. So uh, many students, uh, too, will be rather apathetic about the blatant ideological bias that they're seeing in their classrooms if the college is offering enough other desirable activities, um, environment that, that's really a, a lot of fun, if the social opportunities are there, well, yeah, I mean, I know that my professor in this particular subject is, is uh, kind of soapboxing on some, uh, some pet issue, and I just kind of roll my eyes and put down on the test whatever that professor wanted to hear, and I move on um, from there. Um, and, and then, too, students who are more interested in consumption and less interested in, in building up the signal that we talked about earlier, they may be choosing majors that are not too demanding as well. I'll pick on one of my alma maters. Um, when I was a student at Clemson, um, I had a couple of friends who were um, in the PRTM major, PRTM, which was Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. But we all said that it stood for party right through May. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was not a demanding major. I was talking to a younger relative of mine who's taking some kind of whitewater kayaking course at Clemson um, in, uh, this fall. And I think, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, not sure how it'll help with the major, I mean, with the career, but, but then it's fun. So, um, and then there, so there are courses like this that might be kind of thinly disguised educational, or sorry, entertainment opportunities. Sorry for that flub. Uh, entertainment opportunities that can be taken for credit. And so, if you got more of these taxpayer dollars flowing into higher education, this may enjoy or allow students to enjoy that subsidized consumption. The second crisis I wanted to mention here is the enrollment cliff. This won't take very long because I can show you in a couple of graphs. Look, starting especially, well, we've had a declining birth rate in the U.S. for some time, but especially with the 08-09 recession, birth rates dropped precipitously. All right, well, if you were born in 2008, at what, a, uh, what year would you be 18 years old? 2026, okay. So uh, that's coming, that's, that's real close. So um, starting in 2026, that uh, decline is going to start hitting colleges and universities that are primarily catering to the 18 to 22 year, uh, year old age group. And that is um, particularly hazardous for schools that may be financially shaky already. We've already seen some institutions that have seen declining enrollment even before we get to 2026. Um, one uh, school here in Alabama closed uh, at the end of last year, Birmingham Southern. That was, that was the last, last year for them. I think they had some other things going on besides this, but um, that's, that's a problem. This is something that's called a, a, a population pyramid. It's not very pyramid shaped, but you can see the different age groups here, um, and uh, obviously a lot of baby boomers. Um, uh, you see that it, it does adopt more of a pyramid shape toward the top because mortality gets us all in the end. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, with Gen Z, there's just this, this kind of inversion of that population pyramid as, as the birth rates dropped. You don't have as many of those people coming up into that 18 to 22 year, uh, year old group. Now that's not evenly distributed across the United States. Uh, the states that you see in red are going to see the most severe declines in that 18 to 22 group. The ones in blue are actually going to see an increase. Um, I'm in South Carolina, so I'm very happy about that, but uh, there are other places where they're uh, the, the red is um, going to mean a, a bleeding of students uh, in, in some places. The third thing I'll mention, and I don't have much time left here, but I'll mention rising tuition. You know about this because many of you have seen this. 
We have a huge amount of student loan debt, 1.75 trillion as of this year. That's about almost $30,000 in average debt per, uh, or in debt per borrower. 92% uh, of that is federal, the rest is private. 60% of student loan debt is held by people who are in the top 40% of household income. Uh, now that doesn't mean that, that, that student loan debt isn't burdensome and maybe much more burdensome for people in lower incomes, uh, but we need not imagine that most student loan debt is being held by people who are um, lower income. That's, that's not the case. There are a lot of people that went on to say law school or med school and they, they stacked up hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt that they are paying off. This is largely because of federal intervention in student loans. So in 1965, we had the Higher Education Act where the federal government guaranteed private bank loans and paid interest on those loans as long as the student was enrolled in school. So uh, this, is, this is one of those reasons that you saw that big increase in um, enrollments in, in higher education after 1965. I, that, also correlates, you may have noticed, with the increase in the number of A's that we saw with the great inflation slide. In 1993, we had the Student Loan Reform Act, which tied payments to discretionary income and wrote off any debt after 25 years of payment. In 2007, uh, we revised those payments so that there would be a lower percentage of your discretionary income that would be required as, as repayment. And then in 2010, the Healthcare and Education Reconciliation Act, which nationalized the student loan process, put everything under the Department of Education, and student loans responded by doubling, doubling over the next 13 years, uh, which is where we're at today. Now, as all of this federal money is flowing into higher education, it's tempting to think that well, this is probably helping students, right? I mean, at least we're getting something out of this in terms of people getting a better college education at a more affordable cost. And yet, what we have seen is that as government has poured money into education, tuition has increased. And some studies show that it's almost lockstep. Uh, does this really help students or does it just put more money into the hands of uh, college uh, administrators, faculty, staff, et cetera, that are, that are um, uh, seeing these, these increases in, in funds. Uh, this is a ratio, the ratio of average tuition and required fees for all four-year degree granting institutions to median household income. That is um, kind of an affordability index. If you look at median household income, what's the ratio of average tuition to household income, and that has gone up and up uh, almost without stopping for the last um, 50 years. The Bennett hypothesis says that increases in financial aid will translate simply into increased tuition, so that at the end of the day, the students are not left any better off. Uh, classic, I mean, we've seen this with medical care and a lot of other things. You shovel more money into it does this really make that service more affordable or not? And multiple studies have shown this. Here's one. Again, you can find the sources in my end slide, but um, uh, tax-based aid crowds out institutional aid dollar for dollar. So the more money government pours in, the less money the, the, um, the university itself is going to kick in. Uh, another study shows uh, Title IV institutions charge tuition that's about 78% higher than, than institutions whose students cannot apply for federal financial aid. Uh, another study finds that um, uh, about 60 cents on the dollar increases in tuition as student loan, uh, with, with increases in student loans. Um, so uh, another one says 91%. I mean, these are different methods maybe, and, and you can dig into the details on this, but this is an awful lot of money flowing into colleges and universities. Where is it all going? And well, it's, it's going to luxurious dorms. I mean, one kind of egregious case is Princeton, which spent $138, $136 million on a student dorm uh, with leaded glass windows and a big oak dining hall, uh, a cost of about $300,000 per bed. 
Um, so uh, NYU uh, provided about $90 million in loans, many of them forgivable loans to administrators and faculty, uh, lavish perks for senior higher ed administrators, um, and we just get an increase in the number of administrators. I'm very happy to, to have some people to help me with various tasks that I have to do in the course of my work, but it's probably also the case that many of these administrators are not really all that necessary, but of course, once you get a new office on campus that has a particular mission, you get what you get with any kind of bureaucracy. You get the tendency for that bureaucracy to try to feed itself with increasing the scope of their mission, hiring more people, uh, trying to find things that will uh, not only justify their existence, but also expand their, their authority. And, and this has been seen um, in multiple uh, uh, levels of higher education. Uh, over the last two decades, the number of managerial and professional staff that Yale employs has risen three times faster than the size of the undergraduate student body. All right, well, a few recent developments. Uh, this is very recent, the, the SAVE plan uh, from the Biden administration. This was a response from last year to the Supreme Court's ruling on the previous effort to forgive student loans. The payments are indexed to income, the number of dependents, the size of the loan. But as of July 18th, just a couple of weeks ago, a federal court um, has prevented this from operating. So um, this, is, this is a, you know, I, I have a lot of people that kind of look at this and say, well, isn't this a good idea to forgive student loans? And we don't often remember, especially students who have incentives to, to support these kinds of things, we don't often remember that the money for this has to come from somewhere. It has to come from taxpayers ultimately. And what this means is that you're having taxpayers in general who are funding the uh, write-off of student loans that otherwise would have been repaid uh, over time. So does it really make a lot of sense to have the uh, HVAC repair guy who's um, paying taxes to pay off the student loans for uh, somebody who went through law school five years ago and is, has, has a lot of uh, law school debt? Um, that, that doesn't seem, and, and given, uh, again, that, that a large fraction of student loans are being repaid by people whose incomes are well above the median, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, even if you're just concerned about the equity framework here, not, not the inevitable increase in taxation that's going to happen as a result of this kind of thing. Um, so again, all of this is, 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 is going to create this disconnect between the decision that somebody has, whether they want to go to, to, to college or not, and, uh, and the cost. If, if um, I think that student loan forgiveness is likely to come eventually in the next several years, that may influence my decision. If I'm, if I'm 17, 18 years old and I'm thinking about college, I may be more inclined to spend the money and not care as much about the price if I think that the government's going to take on the burden of my loan in some way. If, if, if this uh, student loan forgiveness looks like it's uh, an increasing possibility. So that tends to, if, if students are insensitive to the price of higher ed, this is just another reason for colleges to increase tuition once more. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'll stop here, and uh, thank you very much.